Uh, welcome to Script the Screen. This is our 10th season premiere. Uh, we are so glad to have Jay Roach back with us for the fourth time, uh, the director of Austin Powers. So let's go back to the 1960s and 1990s. Uh, so Jay, uh, in these trying times, we can certainly appreciate a little Austin. Um, mm -hmm. What was it about this story, you know, and work with Mike Myers that drew you to Austin Powers? Well, we uh, were friends and we, we actually got to know each other talking about World War II history. I, I've told that story many times. I was, had been working on a project about the psychology of evil uh, with Hitler as, the, as the, uh, the weird, it was a very weird art filmy kind of thing I'd been working on. And we started talking about it and he said, I, I got this script you might be interested in. So it was a very weird introduction to, to him, but maybe it was the evil uh, part that got his attention. And then uh, we kicked around, uh, at references and influences we'd both had in comedy for years, certainly Monty Python and, and Woody Allen, uh, those early Woody Allen films, you can see their influence on Austin Powers, but then a whole bunch of other bizarre, obscure, pop arty kind of films that we both loved. Um, and he said, read the script. So I read it and I instantly clicked into all the references and um, Mike is, is just such a brilliant actor. I had a feeling with his commitment to uh, Austin's mythology and, and Dr. Evil's as well, that it could be really hilarious. So it, it was more just the fun of the character. The story was worked out, but it was, it was evolving. It wasn't really super tight by then. Um, it was more just the character and being literally taken back in a time machine, even though he's brought forward the film, the film, it feels like you're being taken back to something else. And, and even in film style, I, I tried to do that where I filmed with old fashioned techniques. I didn't use any steady cams. I didn't use any digital opticals. Uh, it was all shot on film, cut on, it actually was started to be cut on film, but then we switched to cutting it on digital. Um, and, you know, tried to make it seem like if you discovered it by accident, which we thought would happen. We never thought we were making a film that would get, get around that much. We thought we were making some kind of weird culty thing that you might find on cable or something, we knew it would have a release, but it, it just was never, it never was made for anything other than just the pure fun of it. <laughs> so that was, that's what drew me in. Well, one of my student producers on uh, the script of screen called Austin Powers, a love child of hard days, night and James Bond. <laughs> did that's a good reference. Other, did, did these are any other 60s spy movies and TV shows you think significantly influenced your- There's, a, there's so many, I was just reviewing some of my notes from back, you know, there were, there was In Like Flint and the Matt Helm movies, there were the Harry Palmer movies with Michael Caine, which was so enjoyable to get him to do the third one with us. Um, there were these obscure European heist films, kind of pop art movies like The Danger Diabolique, which was a French film, uh, The Tenth Victim, which was an Italian film with uh, Marcello Mastriani and Ursula Andress. And uh, some, we just, you know, I, I was reviewing it today and going, wow, we really ripped off a lot of people. Um, <laughs> And, but we, but in Mike's brain, I think from the SNL training, from his improv training, that's part of how he thinks is just finding or, or sort of absorbing his favorite funny things and then recombining them into something and exaggerating in them. And, and, but I, I, our goal was not to make it feel like a spoof film. It was more like a, an homage and a, a celebration of, of, of all of these film references we had uh, um, so that it, was, it wasn't it was about making fun of them, although that was definitely part of it. It was more like, remember how cool this was? Remember how cool that was? Remember how cool this was? And we we just, uh, we, we were, we had so many references, but the Richard Lester movies were huge for me, you know, Help in Our Day's Night for sure. But even there's a great Richard Lester film that not a lot of people have seen called The Knack, which was, you can, if you see, you'll see a little bit of the fem, fembot replicant uh, vibe with the models in there. So there's, yeah, there's probably 50 different specific influences we could trace. Yeah, I was a little reminded of the Avengers TV show. Yeah. Could be Mrs. Peel and, you know, Patrick McNee's character. Absolutely. Right? Definitely the, the leather cat suit and, <laughs> and Mrs. Kensington's whole idea. But there's some, there's some of the monkeys TV show there's um laughing. I was just saying laughing. Yes, thank you. That's exactly what I was just thinking of. Because the 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 Ming T band was straight out of laughing. Um and the the kind of 
uh, you know, dancers that, that would have been part of Laugh-In, the, the Goldie Hawn style dancer that was gyrating around when Ming-T was playing. <laughs> well, I mean, we were definitely gonna get her into the script and some of the scenes and character stuff, but generally, I mean, you have the ridiculous, the, you know, the, the homage, but you also wanna make the story of meaningful and engaging character yeah. development. So how did you, when you and Mike were like in the beginning of the phase story, how did you want to like, how far do we want to go with the comedy versus we want to kind of make it also a real story. Yeah. Like that's well, we definitely wanted it to be uh, a meaningful story, not just like a good story, but actually meaningful. And for me, the themes were important. It, it is a story about love versus fear, about a, a kind of Dr. Evil's paranoid, almost cold warrior. You know, he's definitely patterned after Dr. No from uh, from the Bond films and Blofeld and all those guys. But they were, there's a sense of, you know, uh, a sort of paranoid world view where uh, an evil, you know, leader will to protect himself and his mythology will, you know, decide to dominate the world. And that, that sort of, uh, that sort of, and it's also obviously a megalomania and, and a lot of other, a lot of other um, evil forces, you know, um, but it was, it was that idea of what we were trying to celebrate was an obviously a superficial kind of almost theme park version of the free love sixties to go up against the fear-based paranoia, which then though, once we knew that was the kind of controlling theme and controlling idea of it, it helped me figure out every possible way of exaggerating and emphasizing things like in the Austin world, it was just pure saturated color, really vivid colors. I tried to avoid white even as a color, you know, or black and just have pure saturated color. And in Dr. Evil's world, it's all grays and pointy shapes. And, uh, you know, one of my favorite motifs that we always try to make sure was that there, there were staircases with no handrails. <laughs> <laughs> there were weird things like that. And so it was the fluid, hippy dippy, uh, sometimes modern art thing, pop art thing, like in the Andy Warhol moment um, in the Electric Pussycat, you know, club that you felt it's all about free expression. And with Dr. Evil, it's all about you know, rigid and, and sort of masculine uh, megalomania. So that, those were all important to me. And, and story-wise, it was just, how is that gonna, you know, how are these two forces gonna, how's that gonna work out? And especially for Austin, given that he's frozen in the 60s and brought to the 90s, I always also described that as being that it looks like it might become a fish out of water story. And you think that's kind of where we're headed, but it's actually Austin, brings all the water, his own water, his own psychedelic water to the 90s and makes everybody else swim around. And he, does, he doesn't think of himself as a fish out of water at all. He thinks of someone as himself as someone who's bringing this great, this great worldview uh, to the modern world. And, and it's only a matter of time before they all succumb. <laughs> well, ironically, Dr. Evil would definitely hate the 60s more than the 90s. I, I, he definitely always looked at Austin as a, you know, he was probably more of a 50s guy who looked at Austin as the 60s invasion, you know, uh, the, certainly the, the British invasion of music, but just the whole evasion of loose morality and, and uh, uh, free, free love and free spiritedness. And they have that, they have that um, debate about their worldviews at the end uh, when Austin shows up in Dr. Evil's lair. So, yeah, so it was actually a chance to work on themes I actually cared about and, and enjoyed uh, making fun of, but also uh, delving deeper into them in a, in a visual expressive way, while also being incredibly silly at every possible step. <laughs> Well, that's why I was into like so. So, what was the decision? The first scene, because the first scene you mentioned the dreary set, which does set up Doctor Evil's world. Well, yeah, but you also don't show his face. Yeah, it was that was really an homage to the way Blofeld is introduced, I think, in one of the Bond films. Um, and the cat, you know, the, the, there are some very specific, you know, spoofy references and that the hairless was, was the main setup uh, for that. And then, I, you know, setting up that the henchmen were at any minute could be flipped into the, the pit of fire, you know, which then sets up the whole, um, Will Ferrell Mustafa joke later when he, he can't be killed. I mean, that's one of the brilliant things about Mike. And, and again, it's all, this is all Mike. I, I really, I, I tried to serve what 
I could tell he was up to, um, and I, I think I, he, he would let me play around, especially in the visual expressiveness, some of the visual set pieces, but it all came from Mike's head and he, this whole recombinant thing we're talking about is something that he's just such a brilliant culture sponge. And then, you know, his dad was a, I was I used to tease him about his dad was an encyclopedia salesman and Mike is an encyclopedia of pop culture. He, and it's all, even before the internet, it was all cross-referenced and, and uh, hyperlinkable, you know, in his mind, which is why he was such a brilliant improviser. He can, he can tap into these things so instantaneously, but then if he has time, he'll pay, set them up, you know, deliver parts of them and then pay them off in a great way all the way through in a really structured sense. And that's how that script, you know, uh, felt from the get go. I, and I just tried to help him tighten it up and, and express, you know, express it using cinematic lingo, cinematic grammar. Yeah, speaking, Mike mentioned he was inspired by the 1969 musical Sweet Charity for the yeah. opening. How for you was it shooting a, uh, a musical number? I, that was definitely new for me. Um, I'm trying to remember how far into the shoot that happened. It was on the back lot at Paramount. And um, I can't remember if it was how far in it was, but again, I was saying before we jumped on, one of the great things about working with Marguerite Derrick, our, our, um, Derrick's, our, our choreographer was she had so many incredible dancers and she would let them play and improvise too. And then she would sort of tighten it up and, and and structure it and Mike would, Mike could jump right in and dance uh, with any of them, but in his own eccentric way, what, what, what people call eccentric dancing, his whole, when you think of Dick Van Dyke and Mary Poppins is always my favorite example of that non-labelable non kind of ex eccentric body movements. And the other dancers just picked up on that. And once I saw the rehearsals, I, I knew exactly how I wanted it to feel and the whole setup of the uh, of Hard Day's Night style photography all the way through that leads up to it. And then when he comes around the corner with the marching band, you know, um, and is is doing the full on thing too. And and that the story, that never would have worked, I don't think, if we hadn't found that song, that Quincy Jones song, Soul Bossa Nova. And we only found that two or three weeks before we started shooting. It just suddenly, that this, this sort of fun and playfulness and almost silliness of the song and sort of, I don't know, just celebration of the that 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 love-based <laughs> world, you know, it had so much mojo. I mean, that's where the mojo came was all, all from Quincy, you know. So that's that made it a blast to do. It was really fun. Now you didn't have a huge budget for the first movie, but you did have wonderful costumes. So how, yeah. How groovy, baby, was it to shoot those? Dean Appel. Dean Appel is was such a genius. I was just, if you have time, just check out the end credit sequence when, when uh, Elizabeth Hurley is the model and he, she's wearing all these unbelievably silly and funny, uh, very out there uh, fashion, <laughs> fashion statements and Mike is photographing her. And, and I just, that I was, it's all the way through the whole film, but it was so condensed how, how much fun she had with the costumes. And, you know, we studied so many uh, uh, old images and old films to get to those and just looked for the most eccentric and outrageous, uh, you know, fashion is, 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 we wanted everything to be incredibly unwearable. <laughs> like it's clothes that you would never wear, but they become like some kind of uh, summer of love opera or something, you know, like it becomes, it's like, it's like it is like watching hair or, or, uh, or laughing or whatever, like, or Tom Jones, you know, uh, the, the singer, we just, and a whole bunch of um, English, uh, there's something, the English dandy was a very specific thing, the fabulous English guys. So um, Mike had absorbed all of that. Uh, and Dina just, Dina just soaked it up and put it back through. Uh, and again, I love the Dr. Evil costume world because it's it's so specific and so different in all its uh, grayness and, and uh, you know, lifelessness. Frau Farbissen's clothes always crack me up. She just looks like a Salvation Army person or something <laughs> compared to what Elizabeth Hurley ends up wearing in the end. Now, I did notice that you might, if you had a bigger budget, uh, decide to hire a, someone to teach Mike Myers how to fire a gun. <laughs> he did not seem too comfortable. Well, that was sort of funny for us. He was 
literally terrified of guns. <laughs> and we thought, well, we could train him to do it, but it's so funny watching him be terrible at shooting. And it almost went again with the theme. He could be cool and badass and, and cold warrior disguised as a swinger the way James Bond was, or he could just be a little more like Clouseau or something where he's, he's not, he's never going to be a good, you know, good in a gunfight. <laughs> and, uh, and then I love the joke when he, the gun he carries is this little sort of, what's that Walther, what's the name of the gun that, um, BK. yeah, something like that. Um, and then uh, Elizabeth Hurley pulls out this massive, <laughs> dirty, hairy sized, you know, uh, magnum something or another um and so you there there's a a funny um masculinity issue let's just say with austin's uh willing to be in touch with his not so masculine side <laughs> even voluntarily or involuntarily he, he's never going to be the the real manly man with the bigger gun i think it's interesting though like we see austin in the beginning being chased by the band girls for hard days and night the women who love him you can tell he's free love everything like that but his first interaction with a woman, Mrs. Kensington, is a non-sexual relationship built on mutual respect. They yeah. Together. <clears throat> How important for you to kind of subvert her expectations a little to show that he had a completely different side than the womanizer side? Well, he he's definitely, I was watching some of it now and even, you know, it's not that many years since we made it, but some of some of his uh, harassing of, of uh Elizabeth's character would never would never fly, I don't think. I mean, that's the whole point of it. And he, we make a big deal that he thinks it's cool, but she makes makes it quite clear that it's no longer cool to be so, uh, you know, aggressive in his flirtation techniques. But it, um, he does, it, there is a sense that he gets how, how uh, powerful uh, Mimi Rogers is, Mrs. Kensington is. And then he, he does with Elizabeth too, one, eventually they, they um, they definitely have gained respect for each other and he she becomes a real partner in crime but then she still is elizabeth hurley and still wears the most incredible clothes ever so that it's not uh it's not purely correct but that again that's partly what um the movie's about is that he, his his as he says as long as everybody is as long as sexual mores are the same as the ones i remember we're all going to be fine and she the look on her face and michael york's face is like uh no that's not going to work out um so it was part of it it was part of the tension between them yeah so speaking of that so how did you work with elizabeth hurley because she's charming educated beautiful she has a lot of other dynamics and not the typical yeah. you know she's supposed to be the 70s bond girl who's just a certain way yeah she gave a lot more depth than you know which surprised me how did you and michael work with elizabeth to create that kind of difference you know, she was she was very uh english and the way she worked with me i find not not uh this is a this is a stereotype so but I, I will say that there is a kind of um faith in the director that that a lot of english actors just go to right away whereas i, whereas I think a lot of american actors are taught and and that this is constructive too to ask a lot of questions really think it through and um michael kane is the great greatest example of it just he's like what do you want how would you like to do this tell me what you want be really clear don't don't be shy and uh and I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll try it. I'll try it anyway. Michael, uh, Tom Wilkinson was very much like that too in Game Change. I was just thinking about that. And that was how it's almost a theater training or a more classical training. Um, and she was fantastic, you know, and it was really important that she um, come across with a, a, cap a competence and a capability and a, an educated sense, but that Austin would threaten that you know that was a whole part of the design that her um her confidence as a woman would be he would he would right away get under her skin you know uh, by by assuming she was like women he had dealt with in the 60s and i thought it was i thought she was so powerful and she she always reminds me of julie christie i was just thinking that again today how julie how great julie christie was in films like shampoo and i don't know what's the film with warren Beatty. i mean there's so many is it Bonnie and Clyde? No, no, she's not. Oh, she was in uh, Heaven Can Wait. Heaven Can Wait, sorry, yeah. And just how, um, I don't know, just she's, you know, the, Elizabeth is a real force and a great actress and uh, was always, you know, this is my, I was also remembering, this is my first feature film. For, I, I, I directed weird films before, but I'd never gotten to make, a, I was the first time I'm on a, on a real movie set, you know, and my first day, I think, was directing um, 
uh, RJ, you know, when I was Robert Wagner, when we were in that giant power plant where we're having the rocket upside down and Carrie Fisher was great. I mean, all these actors trusted me um, in, for reasons I have no, <laughs> I have no idea why they would. It was literally, I was totally green. And um, I think it came from Mike because Mike trusted me almost irrationally. I, I always credit him for taking that risk with me. And he talked Bob Shea and uh, the Todd sisters. You know, I knew the Todd sisters and they helped a lot too because they, we went to film school together. But there was something about Mike's faith in me that, um, you know, convinced everybody to, to, that, I, that I might be able to do it. And that was not based on science. <laughs> that was not science-based. There was nothing I had done to prove that I could do it. He just had some weird instinct that I might be able to. Yeah, the one thing that stood behind the scenes, so uh, it's actually a sequence we'll talk about. Well, Elizabeth Hurley rejects his sexual harassment on the plane. That could have went a lot of different ways because yeah. it's also like it's sexual harassment, clearly. But how did you, how did she and you want to play that? Because she could have pushed our audience away from Austin, but we also had to call him yeah. out for it. And she, she found that exact thing, what you just described. She uh, busted him for it right away. Just, this is not going to be appropriate. But she also finds that there is a certain uh, cheekiness and innocence to it that he's not a, so much of a predator as just a very badly informed, you know, uh, throwback male. And that she would ha that he has to charm her. He has to actually, you know, um, convince her that that he's he, he's going to be good for her and fun to be with. And but he, you know, he finds out right away that uh, you know he it's it's not going to work that way. And it ne he never really uh, achieves anything. And she's she's sort of tries to rationalize it and say, oh, I'm, I'm assuming this is the thawing out process or something with the way she does. Um, but it was, it definitely was a, a dicey thing. What, what, what we always do to figure out how something is playing like that is just screen it a lot. And we previewed and previewed and previewed to, to make sure the tone um, showed that this is a guy who's so out of his time that he's going to say and do inappropriate things. That's the whole point of it is that he's going to be, he's going to be, he's going to think he's out of He's going to think he's bringing, like I said, brings the water with him. But from time to time, it's not going to work. And when he, my favorite moment is he goes down during that montage of not fitting in and he's drinking alone after Elizabeth actually rejects him for being a jerk. Uh, and he's down in the bar and he tries to flash a peace sign at these, these sort of bros in the, in the bar and they, they make fun of him and flash up. And uh, we heard over and over in the, in the previews that it was the moment when they were, they, the audience would sort of decide, okay, this poor guy is so, so lost that he doesn't even know it. And, uh, and, and I think I can, I can still root for him. Yeah, one of my uh, uh, favorite sequences in the movie for my students especially was really the whole date scene with Burt Baccarat playing, which was awesome. Yeah. But all the way to when Austin rejects sleeping with her because you did not want to take advantage of you. So how did you work that sequence? Because that was a very romantic and also a good culmination when he actually says, he says no to her. Yeah, he, he and it shows that he deep down is, is there is an old fashioned uh, kind of sexual mores inappropriateness, but there's also a, a, code, a code of honor. And again, he's not a predator. He's just, just out, show out of time that it's completely inappropriate and wrong. And Mike was Mike had a great sense for that. We we I wanted people to root for them to be together, so we needed him to behave. I mean, if you watch those old Bond films, the way James Bond treated women, it, we we actually when I was doing Bombshell, we had a whole series of clips from different movies that were were it was just taken for granted men behaved a certain way towards women, and almost all of the really you know, uh, kind of unbelievably offensive ones were from James Bond films. So that the idea that he brought some of this forward, but unlike Bond, he, again, is not quite as macho and is, is respects her and, and knows that he shouldn't take advantage of her when she's drunk and should, uh, should um, you know, see her for, for the capable secret agent that she is and that he might be humbled by her. And I think he actually is in that moment. And he's humbled by, it's the, again, it's the one moment in the, uh, the whole film where 
uh, I think humility <laughs> finally cracks through for Austin and, and it buys him a little bit of sympathy. Yeah, but we have directing students in the audience. So we, I'd like to get a recommendation for you. You take Elizabeth Hurley and Mike Myers. How do you direct the scene actors to create an iconic scene to hide nudity? Oh, well, that one, that is a, that's a long story, but I, one of the most, <laughs> it's, a, it's an interesting one to talk about because it was, um, it was really hard. We could not figure out how to do that. And a lot of our physical set pieces, we would rehearse and rehearse and rehearse because we wanted them to seem like an old fashioned, like the way Buster Keaton would rehearse the scene or Charlie Chaplin would rehearse the scene where it looks easy and, and it's, it kind of goes, goes by, but the cleverness of it only comes from having tried a bunch of different ways to do it. And we finally had this breakthrough where I realized, oh, if I just put a whole bunch of monitors around so that it does, so Elizabeth's not looking at a mirror, one particular place, I can line up the camera's view with Mike's body and her in the foreground moving the props around in such a way that if I, she can see where, how it's lining up and monitors all over the room. So her eye line is all over the place and it looks, it doesn't look like she's cheating, but she is cheating. And we, the, the trick though, that we didn't, I just hadn't thought of it was we flipped until the last minute, we flipped the image in the, in, in, the video monitor so it really did become mirror a mirror of it because if you try to move against an image you know that's not flipped you're moving backwards from what you think you're doing when you're moving the props around so we made it a mirror of anyway it sounds it sounds uh, simple now but at the time we didn't have that solution till the very last minute and it's a there's a lot of there's a lot of set pieces where things like that would happen like when Vern Troyer is on top of uh, when Mike Myers is on top of Vern Troyer in the second one, and I know uh, the third one in the submarine, and the um, he's walking around, uh, Vern. The idea was that there's a tall suit where both of them are inside the tall suit, and your expectation is that he, of course, he would put Vern on his shoulders, but then you reveal it's actually Austin is standing on Vern. So you see Vern's little feet at the bottom. We had no idea how to do that, and then we finally figured out how to do it with wires and rails up and down the submarine set. So Mike's always suspended on rails. He's never the weight is never on Burton's shoulders. But that kind of engineering, you know, it, it looks easy when you when you see it in the film. But sometimes they were we, we felt like we had so many engineers and so many uh, conceptual artists and drafts people and and physical effects people that it felt like launching a rocket to the moon or something. You know, <laughs> sounds ridiculous, but they were. And that by then we had money. By the time we were in the third one, we we had real money. We actually had sharks with freaking lasers attached to their heads. Whereas in the first one, all we could afford were we it was in the script, sharks with lasers in their head, and we had animatronic sharks, but all we could afford were bubbles and throwing rubber, rubber <laughs> sea bass. And that's why we we couldn't afford anything else. So we made that the joke. Uh Dr. Evil, uh, we couldn't afford the sharks or the lasers. So we have ill-tempered sea bass. <laughs> so your reaction was similar to Dr. Evil's reaction when you actually saw the oh, yeah. shark with laser beams. Oh my God, we every time we had to scale down because it was a $16 million movie, which sounds like a lot. And it, it, it was even then for a, a low budget comedy, but we were ambitious. We wanted it to have the scale, uh, the sense of scope of a Bond film. We wanted to build an underground volcano lair and we wanted to build you know, real sets and have real action. Um, but we, we, every time we did, you know, like the drill that bores into the earth is made out of some big, you know, cardboard, uh, concrete form. And the, the level of, the level of, uh, you know, no money fun that we had to do, like to, to come up with ways to make things funny, um, just using that, but that, that then created things like the nudity blocking, you know, which we, that's another example. We did the nudity blocking. It worked so well in previews. We couldn't figure out what to call back in the end. And that was, that was like the favorite, one of the favorite bits. So we, we, uh, we flipped it and had Elizabeth walking around nude and Mike handing her giant melons and, you know, cup, cups of milk. And, uh, you know, that was, that's how shameless we were <laughs> just <laughs> fighting for every laugh. Uh, and, and, and it's also, an interesting thing about tone that the tone of that movie we knew would not be for everybody you know tone is everything in that kind of comedy and it was a real commitment 
to, and I will credit Mike DeLuca because most studio people would have buried that film, but only never tested above a 55. And we said, I, we know that it's gonna be divisive tone. No, not everyone's gonna love silly, silly mixed with smart silly, you know, which is what we were going for. Um, some people are gonna be thrown by the silly, silly. So you just gotta decide. And he said, oh, all right, I think it might catch on. And, and, you know, sure enough by the second one, it was scoring through the roof in the previews, but the first one never scored above a 55. And uh, tone was, challenging that I remember from time to time we would screen it for the producers or studio people and they would kind of look at each other until they saw it with an audience they weren't they had no idea if it was going to work and that was that was uh, traumatic for a while <laughs> well, it because we, well, the other key relationship is a father-son relationship now Dr. Evil could have been the Blofeld yeah. cartoon but you decided to give him a angstrom teenager basically yeah. humanizing him in a lot yeah, of I wish I could remember whose idea that was. I, I'm sure it was Mike, but there was a, a writing assistant we had named Michael McCullers who always seemed like, and he became a accredited writer on the second too, but I feel like some of the ideas for Scott came from McCullers. Um, and the, you know, and it was, it, it so beautifully sets up the Mini-Me uh, thing in the second one because Mini-Me then becomes you know, like a competitive sibling uh, to Scott Evil and a, a potential replacement since Dr. Evil seems so um, disappointed in Scott all the time. <laughs> and, uh, but that, the, the, the first or second day, I, I don't think, as I think about it, I don't think the power plant was the first day. I think the very first day of shooting was Carrie Fisher mm -hmm. doing the father-son counseling session when, uh, I, I don't know what may what in the in our backstory made Dr. Evil agree to going to a father son counseling session, but I guess it was Scott's um, desire to to uh, have it, have it um, make any sense at all that his father had come back and was going to be tormenting him so much for not being evil enough, you know, and that's that's what that whole dynamic was is uh, him every the, the therapist tries to get Scott to reveal what what's what's not working in his as a in his youth and he says i just want to do my own thing i want to be a veterinarian and dr evil's like an evil veterinarian no oh, i might be a petting zoo an evil petting zoo and carrie was so fantastic at, at turning everything that they were saying into oh this must mean a metaphor for the kinds of things every father son go through not like you know he's really trying to kill him and he goes no i really am trying to kill him he's very astute and uh that, I love, I love that the scene scene's one of my Bell favorite Bell. scenes. The doctor you were telling a story about how he grew up in Belgium. Oh. I mean, that is the, I, the, uh, know, the boulangerie on. owner from self improving boulangerie owner in Belgium. Yeah, with how he was beaten, he was put in a burlap bag and beaten with reeds, and how a Zuri Austrian, <laughs> the, shorn, the shorn scrotum of the Zuri Austrians. No, it was that is Mike is so a lot of that was improvised too. Mike is so. Um, he, he became very lucid, very fluent in Dr. Evil. He was, he was as Austin too, but there was something about going into Dr. Evil where we just made sure we had a lot of film and would let him run and run. I always wanted to do a, a kind of indulgence cut just of Dr. Evil, you know, and run his long, long riffs. He's really like the Godfather cut of- Yeah, you know, the Dr. exactly. Um, yeah, it was interesting. Now, did you know the bag of shush things would take off so much as the iconic? <laughs> I didn't, I've told that story, you might've seen, but I, we shot Mike's stuff, having that conversation with Scott uh, and Scott whining about various things and uh, about how things are going. And then we turned around and shot Scott and Mike hadn't done the shushing thing. He did it just to provoke Seth mm. on the reverse shot. And he was, just, and he was, he didn't want to actually vocalize and step on Seth's dialogue. So he was using the, you know, as a way to cut him off, but not, and it was so funny. We were all laughing so much that I, I've told the story that I, as a first time director, one of the hardest things to do is to say, you know what, we just, what everything we just shot, we're throwing it out and we're going to start over. So I turned back around after lunch and filmed the whole other side again and went a day behind just to make sure I got that because I knew it was, I knew it was one of the funniest things either uh, ever. And he, then he, you know, takes it into the zip it thing. I just saw, I just saw a, a sort of mashup cut of Dr. Evil doing the zip it thing with Donald Trump in the debate. 
from the other day. They just kept cutting the zip, zippity doo da, zip zip, you know. And uh, seeing Doctor Evil, I mean, seeing Trump try to get a word in edgeways with Doctor Evil made me laugh really hard. So it became a thing. You mentioned improv. Mindy Sterling Frau uh, came from the Crowlings Comedy Group. Yeah. Uh, what what did what did she bring in an improv skills, especially in that great Lucky Charm scene? Trying to describe. <laughs> yeah. And what that Lucky actually was written. I was so funny bringing that up because I had forgotten about that speech. She that was written, but a lot of times it's deceptive because even though it's written it came out of an improv session in the writer's room and sometimes with if i if i'm working with the actors i love to have the writers in and mike too would would want us uh him there but it would also have mccullers they're typing up stuff that the actors were coming up with because a lot of the writing is just improvising even if even if it's not happening on the set but um, you know, Frau uh, Mindy Sterling w was a, a teacher at the Groundlings when we were rec we recruited a lot of those people from. We found Will Ferrell there. We found um, Seth Green there. We found uh, Mike McDonald, I think the guy from the the um, slow motion steamroller scene. The guy yeah, I forgot the guy's name in the uh, the tour guide and Virtucon, But almost all of them were from Mindy's classes and 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 uh from from the groundlings which was a big groundlings were a big force in la comedy at the time and um so yeah i think just her whenever all of them around the table um there they were always especially when will and her were in the same the same room and the great thing about improv is if you're, it's one thing to just say absurd things and, and try to riff off of them, but it's another thing entirely, and she would teach this way too. If you can internalize the character so in such a full way that, that you're only speaking in the character's voice, not your own voice, um, it's so important because the comedy will actually make it into the film. If it's just riffing and you know, kind of trying things and winging things. You want the freedom to do that. And, and we always tried to build in shoot day time to, to play. But if it hadn't been for this commitment to the characters, and I think that's the thing that's sometimes undervalued at improv is just, it's not just making up funny stuff. It's, it's, it's actually writing from within on, you know, like, like in a dream, how fast you can dream live. They're dreaming, you know, on their feet in front of the camera. Um, in character and that is wow will i was a lot of that stuff with him when he wouldn't die and underneath the floor we improvised in the adr stage all I mean, i'm not quite dead you know that whole thing which was inspired by a lot of other things too but and the in the second one when he <laughs> falls over the cliff and he's talking about the that his wound smells like almonds and like the stuff that comes out of will ferrell's brain you know when he's Hopping. I got to work with him again on the campaign with him and Zach Galifianakis and the two of them together. I was like, oh my God, they can keep you going. And you could cut a five hour movie out of their stuff. Yeah, Mike Myers said on the Literary Comedy, he said how he liked the fact that you would get your shot you wanted, but left room as a director, yeah. keep room for the actors. All right, let's do the shot we planned, make sure we got the coverage, sure. but give some breathing room for the actors to try yeah. some stuff. Absolutely. You try to honor the script and you try to not just do one or two takes you try to do several takes that go with the script because it takes that much time to get the structure of the scene and to get the rhythm and everybody's got the dialogue down and then once you've done that a few times and you think okay that could work what else do we have the thing i find about comedies i fear for the future of comedies and studio comedies especially is the perpetual pressure to to shrink the shoot budget to shrink the budget so much it's it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Comedies aren't making a lot of money these days. So that means they can't cost so much, which means you shrink the days. But I think it then means you they don't make money because sometimes time for great actors to play, which is expensive, is uh, the gold. You know, that's where, where it's at. So we fought like crazy to shrink costs in other places to just get shoot time. And comedy, it's, it's by far the most valuable on top of, you know, except for casting and script. If you've got a great cast and a great script, you'd start with your, that. but the next big thing is shoot days. Uh, and I fight like crazy to, to maximize that, to, to give the actors time to try things um, and to shoot as many takes as they can keep coming up with great stuff. And the writers too, you try to have writers around who can, you know, pitch a jokes to you while you're shooting. Um, but it's chaos. Sometimes it's total chaos. So it, it scares the studios how, 
how when you show up that day, you can't tell what is going on. These aren't the lines that were scripted. You go, I know, I know, just trust me, Will Ferrell's on to a thing and I'm just trying. And like the shushes, that was a, you know, that's a great example. If you, if you saw that going on and they say, what? We're they turning around to shoot that all again? That's like, you know, a hundred thousand dollars of, I, I know, I know it's worth it. And that like, I still can't believe I was able to convince them that we had to do that. <laughs> well, the climax of the movie often gets placed in the unnecessarily uh, slow dipping mechanism of Dr. Evil. Of course, he just knows it's going to go to plan like the Bond villain. This also includes the argument where Scotty wanted to take the proactive choice and just shoot Austin. <laughs> How did you approach that kind of sequence? Because you are referencing a lot of the Bond ones, but also having some fun with it. Yeah, that one, you know, that was definitely, uh, that was the, 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 the mutated sea bass, you know, it would have been, they would have been dipped in a tank full of sharks if we had the budget, but um, it, it, it just became uh, a, a sort of, how do we, make sure the stakes are high enough and that it does give that sense of scale and that, that you're just having fun at the spectacle of it all. Um, but you're subverting it with, uh, as you said, with a, a sort of cranky teenager who, <laughs> you know, has played a lot of video games and knows how you usually, you really fix these things. You don't do it the old fashioned way where everyone gets themselves in a life-threatening predicament and then begins a dialogue scene. <laughs> no, you don't, you don't, uh, waste time to talk about your your uh, conflicting mythologies you know in the middle of if, if it was a Tarantino movie that probably wouldn't happen that way so so that was always it is just let Scott be the voice of impatience you know like re and, and it, it's again totally embracing the format of those those big set piece uh, life-threatening things like the laser that's going to saw James Bond in half or the and the, and then making fun of them too by calling it the slow dipping mechanism you know um or or the ill-tempered sea bass or having scott like point scott is the audience rep pointing out the insanity and stupidity of of using this as the way to dispose of of your nemesis and um so you're you're you are mocking and, and embracing exactly at the same time all right so we can't i mean we can't <laughs> Have the Q&A without talking about the fembots, you know. Uh, <laughs> so, how did you land on them as being Austin's greatest foe? You know, I'm very proud of the fembots. The fembots got me. The fem I may owe my whole career to the fembots um, because Mike DeLuca, uh, who was running the the main part of the film studio, and Bob Shea took a meeting with me and really said, "Who are you? What? Why would we hire you? You don't have any comedy. You're not. You don't seem funny." Um, your we your reel is I my my reel, which is what people usually bring in and show clips of things they've directed, were were just clips of movies I loved. <laughs> and they said, that's your reel. We're not just gonna hire Mike's buddy. And the way I think I convinced them was I had helped McCullers, McCullers and I had mostly, and Mike too, but I had remembered the castle anthrax scene in um, uh, Monty Python and Holy Grail when the nuns at, at the castle are trying to seduce Michael Palin's character uh, to prevent him from getting up to the, to the grail, which is supposedly in the tower. And they're just swarming him, you know, and, and they're just seem to be sexually repressed nuns who are running around saying, spank me, no spank me, spank me. And he gets all befuddled by it. And so I thought if Austin Powers is the, the world's most seductive, you know, the most interesting man on in the world, then he, the way to bring him down is to have, to, to worry that his Achilles heel might be women who are into him. And so, um, and that they, that he would have to seduce his way out of it. And so he does this crazy dance uh, in the very first one. I found out a, a very, I had seen Jacob's Ladder, so I came up with a very um, inexpensive way to do the special effect, which is just shoot two or three frames a second while they're moving their heads slowly around. So they, when they play it back at their heads, but I, but I, the idea, I think Fembot, the word Fembot came from McCullers because he remembered it from some old film, but the idea of, of Android, uh, you know, vixens from like a Russ Meyer movie who are determined to um, take advantage of Dr. Uh, of Austin's Achilles heel was something that I, I pitched that whole sequence. I even came up with the shot that became the teaser poster with all the blonde heads around Austin. And I storyboarded it all out with my brilliant storyboard uh, artist, Gabriel Hardman. And um, 
talk, talked it through and, and I got DeLuca laughing and he uh, loved the guns popping out of the bras because that was from the 10th victim, the Ursula Andrus film I was talking to you about. And um, somehow the, the kind of spell I, we all tried to cast that I was the right person for this movie, the fembots, uh, you know, were the final abracadabra. Uh, okay, so now it's become, I'm surprised it became a franchise in itself, uh, you know, its own little genre. What was it like directing Tom Cruise, Gwyneth Paltrow, and <laughs> Spielberg on the same day? Oh, that was, uh, that's the most productive day I've ever had. We, we, the action sequence in the beginning of, uh, doc, uh, of Austin 3 was uh, all second unit. I storyboarded it all, but I sent out two separate units to do the parachuting stuff and then another unit to do the, the motorcycle and, uh, and car stuff. But the, um, the stuff on the back lot at the movie theater, at the on, on the back lot at the movie studio was all shot on one day. Um, again, brilliant Mike move to say, well, we'll just get, we, we, we always, the concept was that to do a sequel, we kind of have to cop to the fact that now we're a studio movie. We're, we were this scrappy, no money fun, uh, quirky comedy. And now we can't pretend to be that. Um, what would, what would if, if Hollywood really was gonna uh, exploit this franchise, what would they do? And so we came up with this idea of, uh, and I'm, I'm sure it was Mike who came up with this, that, that they might, and it was actually a joke because there was a while when, when I, it looked, I, I had to convince people I was a real director. And I remember thinking, well, the next one we'll get a real director. And uh, so the joke was, well, well, it would be Spielberg. And then maybe Mike would be recast as Tom Cruise and maybe, you know, we could get all the biggest stars in the world to come like Gwyneth Paltrow. And, and so uh, it just grew and grew. And um, we the only way Stephen and all of them would agree to do it is if each was only on the set for an hour or two. And so, and they all were clearly kind of enjoying the idea of being there together. And yet they weren't really interacting that much in the scripted scene. So we just said, let's just do them all on the same day. Well, I'll, I had the idea of having set the backdrops roll in and out and, um, and uh, we choreographed all the dance things. We had Steven, Steven was over watching me direct, which was totally uh, <laughs> nerve wracking and actually gave me one note that I actually used, which was he said, when Tom Cruise and Gwen Paltrow turn and look at Kevin Spacey, and he says, when, he's, when they notice Dr. Evil's around, have a little wind blowing on their hair. That was Steven's idea. So I put a little wind machine and he was right. Of course, he's Steven Spielberg. Um, and uh, yeah, but we, we just had it. We had so run the drill knowing ex the, with, I worked with the ADs and uh, we just ran it like a drill. You know, we had everything marked out, a huge crew that we did have the money at that time to pull it off. And uh, we didn't do this, the Britney Spears thing we did another day, but everything that was Tom, Gwyneth, Steven, uh, Kevin Spacey and Danny DeVito all happened on that, that one eight hour day. It was, it, it, was, uh, it was again, preparation. It looked silly and goofy and kind of thrown together in a certain way, but it was so carefully storyboarded, shot listed. Every, every shot was this much of time, you know, allotted to the shot, the 80s mapped out the entire day to make sure we could get through it. Well, we're going to bring one of my student producers on to ask a few questions from the audience, from our students. Yeah, please. Sonia Sherman, one of my student producers, come on on. Hi. Hello. Hi. Um, so I wanted to switch gears a little bit and ask you about one of my all-time favorite movies, which you directed <laughs> back in 1999, uh, Mystery Alaska. Oh my gosh, wow. <laughs> Um, so I just wanted to ask how you got involved directing a hockey movie and what that experience was like for you. I love that movie. I love when people mention it because nobody saw it. It got pushed a year. Mm -hmm. uh, Oprah Winfrey did a film called Beloved and she just said, we're going to come out on this date. And we, ours was on that date. So they said, you know what, we'll just bump this hockey movie, which was actually well received in previews, but we got bumped here and nobody saw it when it finally came out. I, I had never seen a hockey game. I'd never been to a hockey game. I, 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 David Kelly wrote it um, and you know the guy wrote Big Little Lies and Ali McBeal and a bazillion other amazing shows. And I, he had grown up playing hockey and I convinced him that I would make hockey accessible to people like me who'd never seen hockey. But I said, I, the one thing I do understand is a town that 
their whole soul is the sport that keeps them together. Because for me, growing up in New Mexico, next to Texas, every town had its high school football team and lived and died on the success of that team and the sort of Friday Night Lights, you know, vibe. Um, so I said, I'll get that and you'll help me with the hockey. And, uh, and then it was just getting the greatest cast on earth, Russell Crowe, uh, Burt Reynolds, Lolita Davidovich, Hank Azaria, Cole Meany. It was like just casting Fiesta. Uh, and we took over the town. It was like shooting in a pandemic bubble practically because we were in uh, Canmore near Banff and we were there for about six months and it was 30 below and snowing and we were that hockey rink really is a frozen lake it's not a artificial lake that one where they play every Sunday we just kept building the ice and we were we were like astronauts on another planet but we were all in it together and it became a really enjoyable shoot awesome um, so speaking of filming in a pandemic bubble, um, can you talk to us about your most recent production, Coastal Elite? Yeah, Thank we you. we did this show called Coastal Elites. It was going to be a play at the public theater, shot live, filmed live in front of an audience, and then the pandemic hit, so we kind of parked it. But then uh, the the producers and HBO said, well, "What if we did it as a Zoom thing and like people doing the monologues to camera?" but we'll do it a little fancier than that. So we dropped cameras into the actors' houses, waited a day, let them, you know, sort of let the gear, whatever viruses on the gear, I guess, would, would sort of dissipate. And, uh, and then the actors came in on by themselves into the room. I was on a Zoom camera. We did end up having a small crew just outside of their little back office or garage or wherever we filmed it, but it, they were never in the room with anybody and it was except me and the playwright who were on zoom and it was it turned out to be a really amazing experience because it was there was no crew or uh studio politics to deal with just us talking to the actors there was no it was it was like making a movie in a submarine you know or a, or a space station so um turned out to be really fun and those the cast Bette Midler and Sarah Paulson and Dan Levy and Issa Rae and Caitlin Deaver, who, who just kills it at the end in such an amazing way, was, you know, made it, and great writing, Paul, Paul Rudnick. Um, we have, how did you come to work with Peter Deming as your director of ah, photography? Great question. Did you have him in mind from the start or did he get involved later on in production? I didn't have him in mind. He came up, um, and I'm trying to remember now what film I saw, He's because he had shot he had eventually, he might have already filmed something for David Lynch. He, I think he might have worked on Evil Dead 2, uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken. But um, he, I just, I met, somebody introduced him to me. I think uh, Eric McLeod, the line producer, introduced him to me. And uh, I just clicked with him. He's a really funny, laconic, he, he barely talks. He's, I think he's from Wisconsin. He sounds a little bit like the accent of David Lynch. And he, um, he just was... He was just so focused on the work and also had a great sense of humor. So if you've ever, well, I've worked with DPs who don't have a sense of humor on comedies and there's just nothing more excruciating than not having anybody around you laughing. If you're the only person laughing on the set and the whole, the rest of the crew is kind of just staring, like can't wait for lunch. Um, and Peter was the opposite. He was, he would, he believed in comedy. He believed that there was an art to shooting it and to making it look good. And committing to the color, for example. I really wanted every color in Austin's world to be as vibrant as possible and not primary colors. Usually they're off colors, but they're super saturated. Things like that were really important to him. And then I worked with him on the third Austin. I worked with him on uh, Mystery Alaska. Um, I think it was another film, but he was he became my my go-to DP. But that, you know, a lot of that crew were people I continued to work with forever. The, uh, Deborah Neal Fisher was the great editor. Dave Johnson, the visual effects guy, I've never done a film without him in all of my whole career. And all of those, all of those uh, people all came together uh, for, for awesome. The, the Todd sisters too, as I said, my producers on that were, were a big, big part of um, my future career as well as that film. So since we have a lot of production students, students in the audience. Um, can you play professor for a moment and assign us a comedy film for us to study? Oh, okay. Well, that's a good one. If it's, if you just get to one film, I'll tell you the one we studied over and over and over when we were making Austin Powers and not, it'll sound 
um, not applicable in a certain way, but when you think about it, I'll explain why. We watched uh, Young Frankenstein over and over and over, the Mel Brooks movie, Young Frankenstein, starring Gene Wilder. And, um, and we did that because there was, as Mike put it, a kind of immaculate universe, a universe that was every decision in the whole film came out of an understanding of who the characters were, what the time period was, what you were both, again, mocking and, and uh, satirizing at the same time, or, or, or you were embracing and mocking at the same time. And every joke, every, it's all determined by the controlling idea of the movie. You know, it's not, nothing is accidental. And for me, to make a comedy that was as silly as we wanted Austin to be, it couldn't be like a, the Monkeys TV show or Benny Hill or even Monty Python. It had to seem like a whole movie that earned itself. Another comedy that I think is really excellent in that regard is uh, Pee Wee's Big Adventure, where they're really pushed realities, really heightened conceptual realities, but they're very tightly organized within the character, you know, template, the, the, whatever the character is going through, whatever the psych weird psychology of the character is, it's manifested in clothes and music and sets. And um, there was something about watching Young Frankenstein that always made us feel like we're on the right track. Well, Jay, thanks so much for coming, coming back to us for really the fourth time. And Total pleasure. I always love it. I love, I taught, you know, I taught cinematography at SC and directing a little bit for about seven years and I miss teaching so much. This is not the same thing as teaching, I realize, but I, I just love sharing ideas and the questions are always really uh, enjoyable to just link up to. I wish I could see all of your faces, um, you know, uh, as, I, as I'm used to instead of uh, just on the screen, but that's, that's for our, that's post, post pandemic reality. Well, thanks again. And of course, we'll have you back when we're back in the theater. Thanks, Matt. Thanks. Thank you all. Really enjoyed it. Thanks so much. Great questions. Thanks, Sonia. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Thank you. Peace. Bye. Bye.